Some guys really like Batman, and they had an epiphany. So they all got to work on the next Batman movie. And now they are the heroes, and you get to follow along. They're bringing him to life every week after this song. Batman, Project Batman, Project Batman. Fuck yeah. Hi guys and welcome to Project Batman. I am not at home and I miss everybody. But I am Ken Edwards. I'm Vincent Otterbury. I'm Sean Dan. And we are across the country from each other. Yep. Take two. Yeah, this is the this is the second time that we've that we've tried this. The first time ended up being a uh, a disaster. Yeah, I honestly like after that recording, I was like, you know, despite the fact that I'm not in the room with those guys, like I don't know if it's just because I like miss seeing everybody so much and hadn't like interacted with people in a week or whatever, but uh, I. Last week turned out to not only be what I felt was one of the most productive episodes in a while, but just one of the most fun episodes in a long time. And uh, and then, God damn it, if uh, Skype recorder didn't fuck everything up. <laughs> which which is a, is a first. I've recorded like seven podcasts on my other show with Skype recorder, so. But I won't be doing it again. We have new programs for that. But uh, now we have uh, rigged our system. We're miking the car speaker that you guys are talking through. This is like the most the most uh, unsophisticated podcast re- recording setup ever. But hey, it proves dedication. Oh yeah, no, we're gonna get this podcast done today. Yeah. Um. So, um, I think we should, well, well, let's just, uh, go over, uh, a few quick things that I still just want on, on record, even if it's, even if it's just, uh, bullshit, not really pertain- pertaining to our subject matter. <laughs> uh, but, uh, l- l- did you guys ever see Thor the Dark World? No, not, not to see it yet, nor have I. Okay. Well, again, I recommend it. I saw it twice, and it's lots of fun. And if I were nominating uh, people for Academy Awards, Tom Hiddleston would definitely be getting uh, my nod as Best Supporting Actor. Like, that movie... Like, every scene is pretty good, but when he's on, it just becomes transcendent, like, 10 out of 10. There's something that happens when, like, you know a villain already... And that allows that villain to be funny. Like we all, we already know the Joker, so the Jokers are allowed to be amusing. But if we had never seen the Joker for the first time, and he was just like silly, or, or if we had never seen the Joker before, and we were seeing him for the first time, and he was kind of silly, like, uh, like almost like ridiculously so, like to the point of where Heath Ledger could be from at, at times, or or really incarnation, really. I think the first instinct is to be like, what? But, uh, there, I just think they really play on that. Like, we already know, uh, Loki has bad intentions, so all of his lines can be really snarky, and that just leads to great, fun writing. Yeah. And, uh, it, it kind of reminds me of something that, um, we seem to be going for um, unknowingly in this tone. I, I, I read a quote online over the course of the last week that was um, about Joss Whedon. It was, it was a Joss Whedon quote about how he writes. And he's, uh, he said, you can make him cry, you can make him feel, you can make him scared, you can make him, uh, uh, you can make him worry, you can make him happy, but God damn it, no matter what you're putting them through, make them laugh. Referring to the audience. And uh, right. I think uh, we have such a great balance of that between like um, Batman getting shot and uh, Paris getting, you know, cities being destroyed 
we still uh, have fun lines just for like levity's sake and I really think as first time screenwriters we're fucking balancing that out really well if I can pat us on the back Oh yeah, definitely. And it's just like after after writing what I wrote today, I I I got I can I can stand on my third leg now. Yeah, I I'm really excited. This is the first uh, time Vincent uh, is bringing uh, scenes to the podcast that I I had no hand in writing. Like I mean, we all came up with the story, of course, but um, I'm really yeah. I'm really excited to. Uh, to read it, what you got, but I guess um, we should finish uh, what, what we went over with last week. I I hope you still have that list because as our records were um, were were destroyed again by fucking Skype recorder, I'm gonna call them out until they fix their shit. Uh, could you just go ahead and read off the uh, list of scenes that um, I have attributed to myself? And, uh, yeah. uh, or, or just, uh, each of us and just sort of like the title of the scene, just chronolog chronologically for the people knowing, um, just for the future going on. All right, here, let me, let me pull up the spreadsheet. Uh, this is not a different thing. Okay. Okay, cool. So what we've got is that everything up until scene 12, uh, which is, um, which is the scene in the Batcave where Batman and Alfred discuss the new Batsuit, uh, try and guess who did it, and figure out, uh, and, they, and they witness on the news live five attacks happening all at the same time. Uh, so they've got that, and I just wrote that, and we talked about it in the podcast last week, which got destroyed. So we're going over that again this week. Yep. And I'm currently working on uh, those next two scenes, 13 and 14. Uh, 13 being when he arrives at um, the uh, mountain in Colorado, and 14 being inside the uh, mountain listening to the uh, proceedings of the United Nations. Now, uh, you, I remember last week you had an interesting point about him getting into the uh into the place and i just wanted you to repeat that if you could recall what it was uh, i'm trying to remember what it was something about uh batman has like a justice league access code to get in there right and superman calls him out on it but lets him come in anyway yeah yeah okay all right yeah so it was, it was just, right. it was just a general, like, because before we had talked and said that, um, he would come to the front door and say, Hey, let me in. I'm like part of the relief for the victims. And then Superman would come and be like, Hey, it's cool. Let him in when the guards, uh, uh, refuse to let him in. But now we're saying that he's just going to let himself in and because he's, fucking Batman, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. And I, I think we discussed perhaps having him run into some guards in there while he's in there and they ask him how he got in and then Superman vouches for him there. Okay, yeah, yeah. Like a, a, an entrance after the entrance. Like into the main chamber. Right. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, okay. now I remember that. Okay. We, we can move on now. <laughs> okay, cool. And then after that, uh, what I wrote today, uh, I wrote these two today, is the scene in, in uh, Paris where uh, uh, Batman asks to play detective and he finds Talia there. And then later, uh, uh, the, the scene 16, wherein they find a, uh, a dog comes up and, uh, and finds them and leads them to a, uh, a bomb cellar wherein a family is uh, residing. And they take the uh, the dog's blood as a sample because the dog was actually there outside during the Amazon attack. Yeah, and then and then the next three scenes uh, sort of all go together. It's when they're like checking out, inspecting a Lazarus pit, and like having a discussion about what's going on, which leads into a flashback about what happened uh, when Talia was last with Raish and uh, them 
and then leading back out of that flashback and them heading off into uh, uh, Milan to have dinner. That those those I have claimed to, but I have not started yet. Uh huh. And then the next three scenes I have twenty twenty one and twenty two, which is a uh, um, which is the date scene with uh, uh, Bruce and Talia in Milan, uh, followed by they're in the hotel room and they get attacked by a, a Society of Shadows member, and then then I think uh, in if I recall, I can't I can't read it from here, but the uh, there's actually an Abaddon attack. The society member calls the attack on there right then and there. Right. Um, and then uh, scene twenty, uh, scene twenty two, which I also wrote today, was the uh, scene where Raish, uh holds an audience with the clock. Game. Oh, nice! I I didn't know which one you were which scene that was when you said it in the text message. That's cool. Yeah, no, I wrote that today. I have to do a small rewrite on that because I forgot that that's right after scenes 20 and 21, but after I write those, I'll flow it together. Cool. And then, uh, and I think the next scenes are you, 23 and 24. I wrote down 24 twice. Okay, I'll, I'll write uh, I'll write two different versions of that scene since you wrote it down that way. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That, yeah, and those are... Uh, the Joker, right? Uh, it, 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 scene 22 is the ambush. Oh, okay. And then scene 22 is the Joker flashback. Yeah. The Joker always... I'm fucking excited about... That's that's what I'm most excited about writing. I just... I It's standard uh, Batman fan service to be especially excited about writing for the Joker, but uh, uh, mm-hmm. I can't help it. I've never written a Joker scene before. Right. Oh, but, then, which, by the way, I, w- I went to a um, a taping of the Pete Holmes show. Um, Pete Holmes is a great uh, comedian. He has this late night talk show on right now. Um, but he has this uh, painting up on uh, the stage, just as decoration that uh, he painted. And he's not that good of a painter. He more like draws with paint. Like there's no like shadow or shading or anything. Um, but it's just this really, really adorable picture of. Uh, the Joker and Batman embracing in a big hug. Yeah. yeah. I I wanted to get a picture of it, but we weren't allowed to turn our cell phones on in there unless or else they'd be confiscated. So a uh, small tangent, moving on. Uh, yeah. I saw a sketch on the Pete Holmes show that was uh that a college humor put it up. It was something to do with like uh Superman tries to enlist Batman's aid, and then Batman just starts making fun of him. Yeah, yeah, that was a good one. And then it's just like, which character from Hairspray did you base your costume on? Was it Crutchy? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you look up his uh, sketches on that show, he's got... Um, he's got a bunch of ones with college humor with Batman, but um, he also has recurring uh, X-Men sketches, but it's ex Men and he just plays uh, Xavier, and um, like the ones where he tries to hire them. No, he he's firing them. <laughs> like, oh uh, yeah, just like your your primary thing is that you're made out of metal, and our primary enemy is has the power to manipulate metal. Right, right. <laughs> that one. Yeah. He he has a whole se- was- he has a whole series of them. He did there was a good one the other night of uh, Iceman. <laughs> He's like, so you're fired, but if I ever need anybody to spruce up my tea while I'm sitting on the porch, I'll be sure to give you a call. Just like so, your kryptonite is uh, room temperature. <laughs> 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 but, uh, Sean's dad was watching those when I went over there to pick him up today. Oh, okay. That's a coincidence. That's funny. <laughs> but yeah, so the scene after that, uh, the scene after the Joker scene is, I've got that one. It's the scene in the Batcave where uh, Bruce finally tests the prototype bat suit and kicks all sorts of ass in it. And then uh, I also have the next scene, 26. Yeah, the next two scenes, uh, 26 and 27, which are their, uh, uh, 
them recapping the plan to attack Reish's fortress and the scene where uh, Batman takes down the plane that's flying to go for attack. Yeah. And, and then you and I are going to co-write scenes 28 and 29, which are the, uh, which is the main, uh, it's, it's the main, uh, it's like the climax of the film where Batman breaks into the fortress and fights Rage and Talia Sabaton's his Abaddon plant. Yes. That's, that's what, that's, that will happen soon after I get back around like, uh, the 20th or whatever. That'll be like the, our final touches before we go into that last, uh, two weeks of, of rewriting and editing. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, we gave Sean scenes 30 and 31, which are the last two scenes of the film when Bruce watches, uh, the news on TV and, and, sees Talia on the news and then he goes to fight that robber again and then the credits. Uh, he actually, uh, he, he had uh, Matt take a stab at those scenes. We've had Matt on the show a couple times before, uh, one of Sean's brothers. And he, he emailed me the scene and it was, it was pretty good. It was, uh, it was a little rough. It was a rough draft, but it was, it was pretty well put together. I liked it. Awesome. Awesome. Well, okay. So that's um, that's the agenda for our homework while we're apart, and I I guess we can move into um, reading the new stuff that we've written. Yeah. Oh, quick uh, quick side note before we do that is that we changed the location of Rachel's fortress. Good call. Well, I would not have remembered. But... <laughs> yeah. That was, uh, I was just thinking about it today because I, I wrote that, because I wrote a scene that took place in there. Uh, we changed the scene from, it's not the same building that is that we see in Batman Beyond that new part. It's, uh, his fortress is way up north in Arkangel, Oblast, in Russia. It's like, uh, we're, we're going to make it like snowy-ish. Yeah. I don't think it should be actively snowing when we have it. Right. But I think there should be snow on the ground. Like, yeah. I think the weather should be nice except for the fact that there's fucking snow everywhere. Yeah, okay. I, yeah, I think that gives an awesome tone to everything. Yeah. Like, not even the weather is alive. <laughs> Rain can fill literally everything. <laughs> um... Okay, I have, uh, alright, I finally have fucking these, these new scenes up, uh, that you wrote today, but I guess we start, uh, are we, are we, do, are we caught up? Yeah, we got, um, I guess do we want to start reading, uh, the scenes that you did last time? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, okay, uh, I'll start by saying that, uh, there were a few edits, uh, to earlier scenes, and I'm just going to bring those up again just to see how you feel about them a week later. Um, the Alfred line, uh, we had some debate about that, I think, two episodes ago, uh, about changing the line slightly so he could still have a, a bat suit when he uh, went to Paris. So uh, mm -hmm. on page nine, um, Alfred's line is now... Um, well, this one was your last spare. You'll need me to mend you a new suit before you can do anything else. And it's a very, very small edit, but uh, there it is. Yeah. Were there any other ones? Um, there's that, and there was the... When Batman's constructing the uh, bat armor suit uh, that we see in Disappearing Ink and Batman Beyond, uh, he's just got the gray ghost on. Because uh, yeah. because no shit has gone down yet, he has no reason to be paying it. No reason to be paying attention to the news, Batman. <laughs> and uh, I just thought it'd be an awesome uh, way to like. I don't have that exact line yet, but um, we're going to have uh, some line that Batman says later in the movie that's awesome. Like probably uh, against Raish or something. Uh, we'll just have a similar line of the Grey Ghost saying that. Um, in this scene, it'll be like, uh, 
Just like we try to mimic our hero, Batman, in everyday life, he tries to mimic his hero that inspired him. Right. And uh, the other one that's very debatable is on that same page. Um, <laughs> it's uh, Alfred's trying to tell Bruce maybe the suit isn't a best idea, uh, this huge, giant, heavy mech armor suit. And uh, Bruce is like, what about this could be bad? And Alfred says... You were shot in the chest seven days ago. You're not RoboCop, sir. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, and I, and I like that one. Okay. I think, I think it's good. Okay, cool. Uh, I, I was really weary about it because, you know, fucking Alfred's an old man. But then again, Bruce probably sleeps a lot during the day and, you know. Uh, Alfred's got a few ads from Vice, right? Yeah, yeah. Alfred likes action movies. <laughs> Despite how much he doesn't want Bruce going out and doing it. That's the thing that gets him off. <laughs> okay, let's start the the real uh, new scene reading. So we, we had the Raish scene. Um, I believe... Yeah, we read that on an earlier episode, so that's good. Uh, okay, so then after that, uh, beginning page 14. Yeah. All right, so let's just take the same role as we took last time. Somebody's going to have to double up on something. Uh, okay. All right, yeah. So Sean will be Alfred. And uh, you'll be Batman. And Sean, you'll be... I'll be Batman. Sean, you'll be the reporter as well. Okay. All right. Um, and... So this is following the last thing that happened with Batman was uh, uh, he he the Paris got attacked they saw it on the news and Batman was gonna leave and go fucking check it out right then and Alfred's like hold up we don't know anything just fucking hang out here get some rest get some strength leave when we know something uh, and so we're picking up from there in Batman's timeline um, interior Wayne Manor Alfred's quarters morning. Alfred wakes up as if like clockwork in his pajamas and sits up in his bed. He glances at a clock on the wall. 5 a.m. Cut to Alfred buttoning the jacket on his suit and looking himself down in the mirror. He heads out in the, into the hallway. Interior uh, Wayne Manor kitchen. Quick cuts of Alfred preparing a standard breakfast of champions. Eggs, milk, bacon, etc. He displays it all nicely on a tray and carries it up to Bruce's quarters. Alfred lets himself in, carrying the tray. Master Burson is rather early. I hope you managed some sleep. I must say, I'm quite glad you decided to... He approaches the bedroom and sees the bed is empty. Bed. Uh, interior bat cave. Alfred approaches Bruce, who sits at the bat computer. He sets the tray next to the controls. Thank you, Alfred. So no sleep, then? I rested my eyes. Somewhat. Alfred sighs. Let's hope that will do. Figured anything out yet? There's not much to figure out in regard to who's behind it without going to investigate. France had countries that weren't exactly considered allies, but no enemies of that caliber that I'm aware of. Alfred points at the news on the TV. Any development? Not yet. Alfred notices the rogues gallery on the, the back computer. I see you looking at all your old friends. Feeling nostalgic, are we? I know what you're thinking. These are all the ones I've only had to deal with here, other than following them abroad. So why would I consider any of them to be behind this? Because I've got nothing else to go on. As Bruce speaks, he clicks through his rogues gallery past many familiar faces, all with notation as to their status. At large, deceased, unknown, etc., among these faces are Joker, Catwoman, Riddler, Onomatopoeia, Heisenberg from Breaking Bad, Sean Dillon, and others. It won't matter if you plan on saving the world as Bruce Wayne, without your suit, that is. That's where I started. I was hoping you could help with some of the more specific features, but I think I figured out a basic design. Something like this. Bruce brings up a blueprint of the Batman Beyond bat suit. Oh my, what have you so far? As Bruce speaks, he shows graphic illustrations on the Bat computer. 
Do you remember a couple years ago when Barbara made me that stealth bat suit? Do you mean the one with yellow? Yes, the yellow one. I never put much stock into it because I could always rely on my own stealth. But seeing as I'm experimenting with so many features that it couldn't help hurt to keep that one too. Features such as? I was going about increasing my strength the wrong way with the armor. So I've adapted a servo motor from a former Wayne Enterprises employee named Peter Corso. With this form of neuromuscular amplification, I can lift ten times what I normally can, meaning I should be able to match Bane blow for blow. So you'll be safer. Not bulletproof, but I can take a few lead pipes to the head. And if everything else works out like I'm hoping, I won't need to. I had a feeling I'm almost about to find out what you mean. There have been times when escape has been more difficult than I'd like and could have benefited from being able to fly. Oh, you taught yourself to fly? Do you remember Dr. Ballantyne, the Batwoman? Which one was she, sir? The scientist who worked for me at Wayne Enterprises. I kept a sample of a transformative metal alloy she invented, and over time I've been able to recreate it. I just didn't know what I could use it for until now. And I don't see a cape on here. Bruce pushes a button, and the bat suit and the animated blueprint takes flight. That's because I've exchanged them for wings. If I can expand and retract my wings at will, and add thrusters to the bottom of my feet to achieve lift, I can get anywhere in Gotham in no time. You didn't get any sleep at all then, did you? Bruce doesn't answer for a beat, then urgently points toward the TV monitor, which is separated into nine simultaneous newscasts. The broadcasting location is clearly labeled from each originating location. Washington, D.C., Los Angeles, France, Spain, Russia, Japan, etc. Alfred, look. Bruce turns up the volume. News is breaking from Washington, D.C. Urgent news breaks as London, England is suddenly engulfed in a massive cloud of all gas, which appears to be the same method of distribution of a mysterious toxin that was used yesterday in an attack in Paris. Good God. One after another, each station on the nine separate monitors begins to report on the events. We go now to the feed of the cameras located in public areas around London, which you're about to see is live and may disturb you. Footage shows street corners in London where pedestrians run from the cloud, when the gas catches up to them, they quickly dissolve, leaving nothing behind. Within a matter of moments, hundreds of deaths are broadcast in real time on news stations around the world. It appears the weapon, which experts assume to be a gas of some kind, causes the victim to disappear, leaving behind no remains. No further information has been acquired at this time. This is horrible. Not a moment later, the reporter interrupts the footage. This time... She sounds more rushed and worried. Breaking news. Oh, my God. It appears there has been a second attack this morning, this time in the United States city of Los Angeles. No. In the square of the monitor designated to Los Angeles News, the local reporter on scene gets the news, turns around to see his city being engulfed by another orange cloud. Immediately, he tries to run away, but the gas seeps through the studio, killing him and, and the rest of the city live on air. Bruce and Alfred watch on, mouth is agape. What does this mean? It means nobody feels safe. Who could be behind this? If anyone has any idea, I'm going to the one place I can go to find out. Bruce heads for the bat wing. But sir, what about your suit? Not as Batman, as Bruce Wayne. No, sir. What about your suit? Alfred points to the blueprints on the back computer. I trust you, Alfred. I've had it. Do be careful, Master Bruce. You too. Bruce disappears into the bat wing and flies out of the cave. Alfred looks on with concern. I really love how you put that scene together, especially if, like the my favorite line in it is the uh, you didn't get any sleep at all, did you? Yeah, I love that line. <laughs> that was actually your idea. Was it? It was. <laughs> I thought that was your idea. I can't remember who said what anymore. Yeah. Uh, I, and actually, I thought, um, wh when you said it, I remember thinking it was, uh, too, it would be too much of a, of a, of a punchline or something, but, uh, 
the way the timing works right before the news breaks uh, and him not having to answer the question uh, it really works. I have one other thought on that scene since I wrote it, and that is um, this meal that we're focusing on, uh, the, that we spend a moment on for of Alfred preparing for Batman, he sets it down next to the Bat computer. And, uh, uh, that's the, la- eat it at all. that's the last meal, uh, Alfred ever prepares for Bruce. Um, oh, man. so I think it would be slightly, uh, amusing again before all this chaos breaks. If while Bruce is explaining the, uh, the bat suit, perhaps he could just like, <laughs> have his mouth kind of full at some parts so we just like he like we're watching the animation but we hear him eating (laughs) (laughs) i like it i'm okay if we could make it really really subtle so it's not like ultra comedic and slapstick but like subtle enough to where somebody who's really listening can pick up on it Right. Yeah. Right. And then and then when it cuts away, uh uh like and we see them again, you just notice that food is eaten off the tray. Yeah, 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 yeah. Awesome. Well, okay. <laughs> well, don't actually show any eating, it's just make it show that it has been eaten. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <coughs> All right. All right. Well, now uh, we're moving on to what's very exciting to me. Stuff I didn't have to do. <laughs> uh, well, uh, oh, I did it, man. I'm excited. So let me, uh, let me pull that up. Let's do scenes 15 and 16 first. Yep. These are... Uh... These are the the Paris scenes. Batman uh Batman has just visited the United Nations and is going to Paris to see what he can see. <laughs> the other side of the mountain was all that he could see. <laughs> so uh, now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put uh, like I have a bunch of separate scenes. Like some of the scenes that I have are like chronologically next to each other. Like I got 15 and 16, but I don't have 17. And I've got 20, 21, and 22, but not 23. That's fine. But what I'm going to do is, like, each chronological one that I have is going to be a separate file. Like, I'm not I'm not going to try and cram it all into one file. So that when we edit it all together, it's going to be a little easier to work with. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but I think the more, I mean, if it's chronologically together, it can be in the same file. But, you know, if we've got, like... We don't want to try and insert something if I've got, like, scene 22 and then immediately skip to scene 26. Right. Okay. We've actually got it split up really well because we've got, like, we don't spend any more than, like, three scenes not writing. It switches back and forth. It's like a seesaw almost. Y- you know one thing I noticed is, um, uh, the way we split it up is sort of, um, well, no, that's not true. I was gonna say it's like you get all the um, you're doing all the action and love scenes, and I'm doing all the um, expository scenes, which I'm fine with. But then you you also you also get a awesome uh, expository scene uh, with the fucking Clock King and Raish, and I also get a sweet scene in the Lazarus Pit with uh, Bruce and Talia. So it's it's pretty evenly split. Oh yeah, no, I I, I, I think it's. I think it turned out pretty good. Now, I tried in scene 22 to get the uh, racist conviction that you asked for, but when we get to that, we'll get to that. Okay. Yeah, yeah. All right. Okay. Uh, Okay. So, are we uh, casting this the same way? Sean, Sean, are you playing Um, Talia? Do what? I said, is is Sean playing Talia? Sean, do you want to play Talia? I'll play Talia. Okay. And uh, you can narrate, and I'll be Batman. Awesome. All right. Exterior Paris, France, dusk. The Batwing flies into view of a large overhead shot of Paris, France. The city is seen to be a a shambles even from this altitude. Many blocks seem to have suffered power grid failure. Smoke rises from many buildings, and there's no movement whatsoever. Batman flies over some guards on a highway entering the city, but they do not notice him. 
He continues into the heart of the city, setting the Batwing to land in a clearing in view of the Eiffel Tower. Batman puts on a gas mask, exits the plane, and gasps at what he sees before him. Cars are crashed into one another, piled in the middle of roadways. There are no brake skid marks, no shown attempts to stop. There are no bodies anywhere, just occasional scattered piles of clothing. Nothing stirs, nothing lives. Batman begins to walk around this land of death, searching for any clues that might help tell him how this nightmare world came to be. The only sounds he can hear are the eerie howls of the wind. Batman walks toward the Eiffel Tower. None of its lights are on. It stands like a gravestone over the surrounding city. Batman looks down at the piles of clothing, each one representing a life lost. Batman stops at a particular pile of clothes, clearly belonging to a little boy. A toy airplane sits next to it. A few feet away, Batman spots a video camera and picks it up. The battery is dead, but Batman has no trouble wiring it to a battery pack on his belt. He flicks through the menu and plays the most recent video. He sees the little boy playing with the toy airplane and hears the woman ha holding the camera laughing and cheering the boy on in French. Something falls from the sky in front of the boy. Several more seem to be falling in the background. The woman beckons to the child to leave it alone and back away when the objects emit orange smoke, vaporizing the boy. The woman has just enough time to scream in unison with all the other dying people before she, too, succumbs behind the camera. The video ends. Batman takes the card out of the camera and slides it and the power wires back into his belt when he sees someone across the park. A lithe female figure, clad all in black, including mask, looks at Batman a moment before realizing she's been spotted. She flees. Batman gives chase, but the figure is quick. She throws a smoke bomb over her shoulder at Batman. But he, wearing a gas mask, takes no notice and continues. Stop! Finally, Batman corners her in an alleyway filled with what were once shops. The figure then attacks Batman in a brief scuffle. The figure aims a blow at Batman's face, but he catches her arm, pulls her close, and takes off her mask. The woman twists out of the hold, and her face is revealed to be that of Talia al Ghul. She stops moving and brings her arms to rest by her sides. Batman also lowers his fists, but only slightly. Talia, what are you doing here? Talia simply looks sadly at him. Explain yourself. Now! You don't seem happy to see me, Bruce. Last time I saw you, you tried to kill Superman, and now I find you here, the only living thing in the world's biggest murder scene. So no, I'm not particularly happy with you. I want answers. I'm here for the same reason you are, to find out what happened to you. Then why did you run when I saw you? Because I know this is how you'd react and that you wouldn't believe a word I said. Your father is behind this, isn't he? I believe so, but I don't know for sure. You don't know? I haven't spoken with my father since one of the last time I spoke to you. Batman finally lowers his fists all the way and moves slightly closer to Talia. She doesn't budge and just looks at him solemnly. Batman looks slightly confused. What? Why haven't you split? <laughs> A dog barks off screen, startling them both. They look behind them at the head of the alleyway and see a black Labrador panting at them. The dog barks at them again and starts jumping around. How did he survive? I don't know, but I think he wants us to follow him. They look at each other one last time, making it clear their conversation is not over, but Batman nods as they depart after the dog. They, they walk a ways along, not talking, just listening. Batman notices a squirrel moving along a telephone wire, and Talia sees a pigeon flying overhead. That's something I noticed earlier. All the animals seem to have survived. You scared some off when you landed earlier. Hmm. Whatever this weapon is, must only target people. Some sort of biological agent, like a gas. The dog barks again and leads them off, in, off to a small house, the door ajar. The dog walks in.
Batman pulls a batarang, and he and Talia go in after. They go into the kitchen to see a metal door, like a bank vault, to, to which the dog is barking. It opens, and a middle-aged man comes out. He looks at the dog with glee. Caesar! Caesar the dog runs up to the man, who embraces him. Caesar then barks at Batman and Talia. The man notices them for the first time and screams. The two of them, clad all in black, must appear pretty frightening. The man runs through the metal door as Batman calls after him. You hold on, I'll come now. We mean no harm. <laughs> I like your dubbing. Uh, <laughs> the man heads back up, still shaking, but beckons them downstairs. There, the man heads over to his wife and young daughter who also scream, but he comforts them. Another man, looking entirely dissimilar from any of them, comes up to them and speaks to them in English. Who are you? I'm a detective, and this is my associate. The man looks at him in disbelief for a moment, then gasps. <gasps> I know you. You're the Batman. I've heard of you last time I was in Gotham City. You're American, I see. First, I suspect? Yes. I was here with my daughter. She... He tears up. Batman pats him on the shoulder. I'm here to figure out who did this. What can you tell me? Not much of anything useful, I'm afraid. We were just shopping when we when this cloud of orange smoke appeared. My daughter and I ran, but she tripped. Monsieur Renardo over there saw me running and yelled for me to come here. This is his safe house. His grandfather built it after the Nazis came in World War II. He's got food, water, and shelter. He and his family have been very good to me, comforting me. Their son was lost too. We send Caesar out once a day to look for people. Whatever's out there didn't seem to hurt him. He came back about an hour after the attack, completely unharmed. Batman looks over at Caesar, then back at ma to man number two. I need a sample of his blood. If he was out there during the attack, whatever agent it was that killed everyone might be inside him too. Okay. Monsieur Renardo? Man number two walks over to uh, Monsieur Renardo and has a quick discussion with him, then comes back to Batman and Talia. He says that's fine. Just promise us that you can find whoever did this and make them pay for what they've done. You have my word. Batman whistles to the dog, then pulls a vial with a needle out of his belt. He pricks the dog, expertly too, because the dog doesn't yelp. And fills the vial. He turns to Talia. I need to analyze this back of the bat cave. You? I'm taking you to the authorities. What? No, I'm going with you. How do you figure that? You're forgetting something. You're going to look for my father, but you have no idea where the Lazarus pits are. I do, and I'm going to help you. I don't want your help. I can find them on my own. How do you think you can do that? My father searched for decades just to find one, and it seems to me like you don't have it, that you don't have a lot of time. So I'm going off to find him. You can either accept my help and come with me, or you can go your own way. But we both know you're not going to stop me. Batman sighs, conceding defeat. I guess you've got me, but I'm keeping a close watch on you. Talia smirking. That's how I prefer it. She walks to the exit, leaving Batman slightly reddened. Batman turns to man number two in the family. I'll send help along to you, you and any more survivors. Merci to all of you. Batman leaves them all and exits. That was awesome. I love the tone of it. I, lo I love how fucking dark and sad it is and how much like death is underlined and highlighted like right when he arrives there. I love that uh, Batman treats Talia like 
like any other fucking criminal because he just assumes she's behind it uh, be, for obvious reasons. And um, I I love the whole thing with the family. Uh, uh, I think we should name man number two just because uh, he could introduce himself and that would be easy. Uh, but I, I was thinking about it. I was thinking about it. Um, and there was a specific reason why I didn't have him do that. There, there didn't seem to be like a spot, at least the way I had it written, that he would want to introduce himself or whatnot. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, maybe maybe after Batman asked if he's American, you know, something of like that. Right, right, yeah. Also, plus, if, like, you're, if you suddenly find yourself in the presence of a, uh, quote unquote celebrity figure or well known figure, um, and you're one of the last, uh, living people in a area, you'd probably want them to know your name. So, yeah, I guess you're right. Um, but other than that, uh, that and, um, I had one other little note. It, it w- wasn't, major at all i'm sure uh, i'll i'll figure i'll figure it out later um but yeah i i really like it all i really like it all also yeah, I, had, also, I had a lot more typos in there than i thought yeah that happens i mean you, you've seen that happen every time we've read my scenes too um mm-hmm. uh i think talia <laughs> it'd be it'd be a really smart ass uh uh, power female move, which I really love the dynamic, like she's holding over him at the end of that scene there. Um, but I, I really think it would be awesome if she would like mention the fact that like, I, I could go find them without you, but also you have the bat wing. Like this is an exact dialogue, but you know, like you have that thing and we could save a lot. (laughs) You could help me save a lot of time as if it would just be like him doing her a favor. Ah. (laughs) <laughs> like it, it's just uh it is like I'm not editing you I'm just saying that's a that's just an right. angle you could play it um it, it doesn't make sense but I was also assuming that she also came here in a plane yeah. right okay yeah, yeah yeah good call good call oh uh, yeah no I hope Google Translate did that okay I mean, it, it works it, it works really well in short bursts like I wouldn't I wouldn't try and translate a paragraph to something real simple like that uh yeah and yeah see I I, I realize I love writing for Talia because she is kind of spunky you know like people always say that nobody ever tries to write strong female characters and I really think that we should accentuate that she is a very strong character, like, you know, really strong-headed and strong-willed, her, her sole weakness being her father. Yeah, 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 yeah. I... She, she isn't weak in and of herself. She just has a weakness. Yeah, as, as soon as she showed up while we were reading this and she defended herself and uh, didn't just, like, give in to what he wanted, like, automatically like i think you've hit her on on the head of like how how strong a character she's supposed to be in that regard uh and it really like i know we've said it before and obviously it's a theme of this but it hadn't really like i haven't like felt it until i've actually like read out loud or read a scene with talia like how the contrast is of like how sad it is that, like, look how strong she is without her father, yet she can't let go of him. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. I want that... What what do you guys think of the flirting? Ah, I like it. Especially that last line, you know, I like how I prefer it. Um... I... I didn't have a, uh, reaction to it when I read it. Like, Like, didn't think that was weird. Um... Um, I I suppose, I I suppose it's something that you have to really get out of their acting and and expressions as opposed to just through a read. Right. But, yeah. Yeah. It, it, I was thinking that too because yeah, like it it can be it can be done, but it still has to like uh, convey the aura of their there's very serious business at hand, despite uh, our history together. 
But yeah, it's just like, uh, but yeah, I figured that start, start that very subtly, but early, and then just build on it later. Yeah, I like that. I, I think it's good. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, Paul is a surprisingly fun character to write. And a fun character to read. I mean, not that I, I read her part, but you know, right, like, that w- I'm just saying, that was like six great scenes to follow along with. It wasn't boring, it was great. I think that's our um, longest scene so far. I think uh, Breakfast with Batman is is five pages, so... Um, but, uh, that's, that's two scenes together, and that's six whole pages. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then this next scene, with scene 22, is just over four. It's like four and then a paragraph. Awesome. All right, well, let's let's get to that. All right, this is the scene where in uh, Raish hires the clock king. And I'm ready, i got to write the scenes before this, so I've got to have some sort of flow into this. But I'll work on that when I write scene 21. I'll probably, I'll probably do scenes 20 and 21 tomorrow. Cool. Yeah, this is immediately, <laughs> this is immediately following, uh, they're Bruce and Talia's day at Milan and uh, Bruce and Talia having to escape Milan when a uh, another attack happens. Right. They will have to know, like, Raish will have to know that his men failed and know that they are doing shit. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I said, I'll, uh, um, I'll worry about that when I why I probably together tomorrow. Okay. All right. Well, ob- obviously, uh, you'll play Raish because I love your Raish voice. I will, I will narrate and play uh, Clock King. Uh, no, I'll narrate and play Ubu, and Sean, you play Clock King. Okay. That's my mommy. Can you do a real nasally voice? Off through your nose. All right. Interior. <laughs> uh, well, try and try and sound really haughty. H a u d h t y. Not h o t y. Sean always sounds haughty. <laughs> All right. Interior. Rachel Ghoul's fortress. Night. Ubu enters the meeting hall to find Raish sitting at the head of the table. He crosses the room over to Raish, but does not sit down. Are you sure about this, master? This man is very... <laughs> How does Ubu sound? <laughs> He's really gruff. Infidel. Okay. Are you sure... He's literally voiced by a different person every time he's been in the, in the series. Okay, then we should... That That's funny. We should... Unless they try to make him sound uh, really similar every time he's in the series, we should make him sound different. <laughs> I need to know about this, Master. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll, okay. ju- I'll just I'll just go with Gruff for now. Are you sh- okay. are you sure about this, Master? This man is very unusual. I don't trust him. Raish looks up and simply smiles at him. You don't have to, nor should you, but you do need to trust me. Raish calls towards the door. Send him in. The door opens, and Temple Fugit, the clock king, briskly walks in. He's wearing his trademark clock-shaped glasses and walking on his clock hand cane, leaning on it a bit more than he did in his heyday but still carrying a very business-like air about him. He addresses Raish in a fairly annoyed tone. You have precisely three minutes to explain to me why you took me from my home and why I am here. I hardly think I'll need even that long. Please, take a seat. The Clock King sits down at the table, opposite Raish. Ubu glares at him. I suppose I'll get to the point. I am he who is called Raish al Ghul, and I need you, the Clock King, 
to assassinate the crime fighter known as Batman. My own agents have proven unable to handle him. The Clock King's eyes widen, more out of interest than surprise. Interesting. I had a feeling this was going to be that sort of business, but I don't do that sort of thing anymore. I retired after war was in hell, managed to leave Gotham City. I am aware of your past with former Mayor Hill. Yeah, hold on, let me read you that. I am aware of your past with the former Mayor Hill, and would like you to know that he has been disposed of. Rache slides a photo toward the Clock King. Clock King takes it, and it, it is seen to be a photo of the body of Mayor Hill with a poison dart sticking out of his neck. Clock King smiles. I wish I could have been there to see it. You have my interest. However, I'm curious as to why you'd want me to badly, want me so badly for this, and not to murder someone you've never met just to prove yourself. Why not Joker, or Killer Croc, or any one of those other people? Apart from being a maniac, as far as I can tell, the Joker is deceased, presumably through some altercation with Batman. And do you really think the animal killer crop could be trusted with a task such as this? No. Of all the detectives' former adversaries, you are the one who seems to be both mentally stable and competent enough to handle the job. I'm flattered. But I have no interest in money. I did have enough to bribe my way out of prison, you see. I trust there's something you want, though. Yes, actually. My guess is, is that my guess is that you've been behind. That's a good thing. Yes, actually, my guess is that you've been the one behind all these attacks on the wall. Raish smiles as though he was complimented on his attire. <laughs> you guessed correctly. I must say it seems a little bold, but if that's your plan, then I'm. Like a country of my own. Japan, if you can spare it. That seems quite reasonable. Very well. The islands of Japan are yours upon the death of the detective. There's one more thing I'll need for this to be successful. A few of these. Clock King pulls a blueprint out of his briefcase and hands it to Raish. It is a blueprint of the quantum temporal manipulation devices that the Clock King used in Time Out of Joint. Hmm. I believe this will be no trouble. Do we have a deal, Mr. Fugit? Yes, it's a deal. Clock King stands and shakes Raish's hand. Perfect. I'll leave you to your preparations then, and the plane will be provided to take you and Uru to Gotham City. Ubu, for the first time, comes forward and speaks. What? Yes, Ubu, you will accompany Mr. Fugit. You know the whereabouts of the Bat Cave, and Mr. Fugit, with his demolitions expertise, can circumvent its defenses. Ubu looks at the Clock King, then turns to Raish as if to argue. He seems to think better of it, though, and remains silent. The Clock King turns to leave, but stops midway and turns back to Raish. Before I leave, I'd like to know something. This whole thing seems to be a bit more than a thorn in your side type of problem. Raish looks back at the Clock King, looking somewhat regretful. Yes. The detective and I have always had a mutual respect for one another. And years ago, I'd never have dreamed of having an assassin kill him. However... Every time we've met, I have been very honorable in facing him, and after too many times, I realized this was folly. However much respect I have for him, I cannot allow my wishes to grant him a courteous death to conflict with my master plan. Which is, may I ask? I wish simply for a balanced world. No more, no less. A world wherein humanity bows to the natural order of things instead of challenging it. And I do not care how many deaths it takes to get there. He looks at the Clock King with a look of finality. The Clock King curtly nods, then leaves. Ubu then comes over to Raish. 
You're giving him an entire country? Why would you do this? Are you questioning me, Ubu? No, Master. Think about it, though. He has what he wants, and so do we. And should he ever become problematic to us, what country could possibly stand up against our might? I love it. I, I love it. I, I love that it's straight and to the point in uh, every way. Uh, uh, I love that, you know, I, in my head, I had I had uh, imagined a much grander explanation from Raish about why he's doing everything. But you have it here in one, two, three sentences. And it's awesome. It's Thank you. Yeah. Like, I was, you, you, I was trying to really because I... I couldn't quite, uh, I, I was struggling with the whole racist conviction thing here. Because you said that was what you wanted to find in this scene. Did I do that okay? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah, yeah. The, the scene is so, um, so much a therefore, like, a therefore follows this scene and a but <laughs> precedes this scene. Like, but, <laughs> Rache is cooking up some shit. With another evil dude, therefore some shit's gonna go down. Like, like it's, it it's excellent. The the only the only note I have, and it's a very 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 small one, is um, I love how you add words like um, briskly. Like uh, when Clock King walks in, he's walking briskly. I think at some point in the proposition, um, be it uh, whether he's at when he's asking for a country. Or when he he uh, presents the idea of the uh, time belt, uh, I think he should. This should be such a huge thing, like such a massive like undertaking, and so like uh, nuts that anybody asks this of him that uh, we see the clock king hesitate. I think that like just for a moment to like be like damn <laughs> like may, maybe not he's not like surprised or like scared or anything but like if even the clock king can take in how crazy this is and Raish can't see it like i i think that would be cool do you, do you i think that could be good cool. yeah because that, that um, you're gonna do notes for this episode right yeah definitely Okay, cool. So I'll uh, put that in your notes, and we're going to go over the notes when we're reading through the entire rough draft of the script. Yeah. When we get everything, just we slap it on the page and slap the pages together and come up with a, just a, a shapeless ball of clay. Mm-hmm. And then we'll go, I think what we'll do is we'll go through the notes and look over, oh, here's ideas we had, here's this, here's that, here's something we forgot. So go through everything that we have said, and then I think I think that's something we could uh, we could work on. Okay. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. I'm definitely not asking you to edit uh, this soon. I'm just saying that uh, that I think I think that the the rewriting slash entire script editing process will have to be one uh, very collaborative sit down all together process. Um, and the other thing I... Oh, yeah. The, uh, I mean, I, like, that couple of weeks, we're going to have to do more than one episode a week. Oh, yeah, def- definitely. Like, I like mean, guaranteed, we're going to have to do at least two, possibly three. Dude, I mean, with 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 how much free time I'm going to have when I get back and how much uh, fucking uh, excitement I'll have the, by the fact that we're almost be almost done with a fucking completed Batman script, I'm sure I'll be... I'll be over at your place every night until we finish it. Um, oh, yeah. And then, like, and the thing is, though, is that what I think we're going to have by the end of the year is I don't think we're going to have the final, okay, let's go storyboarding script. I think we're going to have the final rough draft that, or like the final draft that we are happy with, like in terms of just us editing throughout the month of January. We should, you, you remember all your uh, friends that said that they wanted to help proofread it from your writing class, get them, put an open call out, anybody that wants a copy of the script to read it, proofread it, give it back to us, and throughout the month of January, hammer out what they send back to us, see if there's things that, that like a whole bunch of people didn't like, a whole other shit, 
you know, just get it all together, and then at the end of January, have a complete, total final script. I I'm with you. I think that sounds great, and um, I've got the uh, one of my top ten favorite podcasts in the world is um one called Gobbledy Geek. Uh, you've heard me speak of it before, but uh, both of those guys on it are obviously huge geeks and uh, massive Batman fans. And they're the reason it's such a great show is because even though they're both interested in the same things, they uh, both uh, go at things in such different ways. One's very critical and meticulous and sort of uh, true to lore, and the other one's more open to uh, freedom and um, a- having a good time and fun with things. So um, they're they're just a, a pair of opinions that I massively respect, and uh, they've agreed to come on and do a whole Project Batman episode about our script with us. They, they've agreed to that? Yeah. Whoa! That's fucking awesome. Yep. They they said uh, j- uh, they don't want uh, like our first rough draft. They want like the three of us our, our our final rewrite like before we present it to anyone else to to be the one that they judge or read or whatever. That 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 gives me a little bit of an erection. <laughs> I know, right? They're. Uh, they, they've become good friends. I actually uh, on this on this trip, I uh, I stopped in Birmingham, Alabama, and uh, hung out with uh, one of the guys for a night. Um, Paul, he's a he's an awesome dude. Uh, I'm really grateful that they're uh, willing to do this and help promote our shit for us. That is the best thing ever. Yeah. Um. Uh. And then. One other thing about that last scene we read that I, uh, just quick question, uh, slash note ah. suggestion is, is there a particular reason you, uh, had Clock King request multiple time belts? Because in my estimation, he would want to be the only one with one and we would want to believe that that one got destroyed. Therefore, in the climax, when Talia discovers the pile of them, it's like a surprise, like, oh, of course the Society of Shadows created much more of these, and, like, all of a sudden she can, like, overcome her obstacles, like, when we thought there was no hope. Yes, actually, there is a particular reason. Okay. Um, remember that sometimes he uses them for specific things. He has one on his person. Perhaps he puts one on... On like an alarm system, that would be a really good use of one. Is those things have lightning fast reflexes? Well, if you slow it down to a millionth of, of the, the speed of molasses, then what the hell is it going to do? Okay, so um, for anyone who ha- maybe hasn't seen the episode, and sort of for for me, just for notes, um, because I'll be writing the scene in which he implements this device. Uh, can you just explain, uh, in as much detail as, as you can, your, uh, understanding of the time bell and not like how it works, but you know, what he does with it and like how it's portrayed. I would love to. Okay. So in the episode, in the, I think it's the second season episode or maybe third season, season two or three of Batman, the animated series called time out of joint. Um, the main antagonist is the Clock King. Uh, and in this, he pretends to be the butler of a scientist called Dr. Wataki, who, I just looked this up today, um, who made, who basically designed a belt that is you know, like a device, it was not so much a belt, but it is a device that, uh, disrupts time fields. Basically, he's a man that works with something called quantum temporal theory, basically speeding up and slowing down time around things. The practical purposes are, you know, things like stopping car accidents before they happen, uh, growing food quicker so it can, uh, so you can grow crops faster and world hunger, shit like that. You know, dozens of different uses. Now, the Clock King is pretending to be this guy's butler so he can steal a bunch of these things and use them to kill Mayor Hill. And basically, these devices, you can put them on your person, 
and you can speed yourself up in comparison to everyone around you. He does it, the clock king does this quite frequently in this episode. In this episode, he, you know, he actually just stops like security attempts to arrest him or something like that, and he just stops time around him, and he just walks past them, and he he calmly walks up the stairs, like he doesn't run. He just walks because he's got literally all the time in the world. He also uses it to uh, instantly steal uh, a clock out of an auction house just to test it. He, what else does he do? Yeah, he puts Batman and Robin out of commission for like 36 entire hours by putting one of these things on the Batmobile, setting it to speed the Batmobile up. Uh, or, yeah, yeah, it was to like, no, it was to freeze the Batmobile in time and like 36 whole hours pass in the space of about, what is to Batman and Robin? About 20 seconds. Yeah. And I mean, like, and that is one of the reasons that I always thought the Claw King was one of the most dangerous adversaries was because of these devices. And like, he doesn't just use them on his person. He can use them on other devices. He can like stick one to a car and make it stop. Yeah. They actually, um, Batman sticks one to a bomb at the end of it. He takes one of the Claw King's spares and sticks it to, uh, oh wait, no, that's right. Uh, Dr. Wataki gave Batman and Robin a few of them so he could fight this, so they could fight the clock king. And Batman actually takes one and sticks it on a bomb to slow down the explosion. Okay. See, uh, yeah, okay, in my memory of it, there was, like, he just had one on him and he could manipulate whatever he wanted. So, um, I'm glad you explained that <laughs> before I wrote, uh, that scene. Uh, awesome. Yeah. And if, and if you need the, uh, if you need any help writing that scene, let me know because there are there are some particulars in there. There were a couple of things that I really wanted to see in there. For example, a scene of the clock king just walking, waltzing around, throwing fucking pocket watch bombs at all the fucking lab equipment, not even looking at it. Right. I just just a scene of shit. You, know, you can tell the guy's not insane, but you can tell he. He has a bit of a sick pride in his work. Right, right, right. Yeah, um, I, definitely I'm going to go through every note um, we've ever said on any of the scenes that, like, um, I write. So, uh, and also, like, uh, even if, like, right now I, I didn't notice them when we read the scenes you presented today, we might have had thoughts on them in the future that, or, or I mean, in the past that we forgot to implement or shades of a certain... Um, idea that we wanted to portray that um uh, uh yeah i want i want the most recent incarnation of the notes yeah yeah um when i get an internet connection later i will i will email them to you okay cool um but uh yeah so so we will we will definitely make sure by the end of all this that all three of us will get to see everything in every scene that we want to see. Right, right, right. And that's, that's just what I'm concerned about. Yeah. Just, there's, there are certain things that I might forget when I'm writing that you really wanted to see or vice versa, and we got to make sure that all of our ideas go on to every page. Exactly. Like, I mean, basically when we're... That, that Breakfast with Batman scene, that's... I mean, honestly even though I wrote the scene, like I typed it out, you wrote that scene. I mean, I think you basically had all the major points of that scene. Like you, you presented all of that. Oh, yeah. and, and everything that I wanted to see in that scene, you have there. Like I have no complaints about that. scene. Cool. I'm glad to hear that. Um, well, we are currently, uh, uh, 10 minutes from my, uh, buddy, getting home from work so i'm gonna try to uh see if his guys or if his band's done practicing and we've got a good uh about hour and 20 minutes now anyway and cool, uh, cool. Uh, what, uh, what what band is that you know oh i uh i would have been able to tell you had you not asked uh they're not like a major band they they had a record release party in los angeles like last month and they they're like opening 
for the opener of a like lesser known like of sort of like a uh, underground popular rock band so it's it's not like a major act or anything but they're they're big enough to a, they toured Europe last month which is pretty fucking nuts yeah. that that my friend from years ago is now tour, touring Europe in a band um that's uh, yeah now because Sean and I were just curious because we had remembered because you had mentioned that they had toured in Europe I was like holy shit I'm still like freaking out about we're gonna have Dolly Deeds on our on our like I, I I'm I'm not gonna lie I've never listened to an episode of Dolly Deeds just because I don't what I need to do is I need to start putting podcasts on my phone and listening them at work. Dude, it's the best way to pass the time when you're doing anything. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna start I'm gonna start doing that soon. There's is a, a bunch of podcasts I want to actually listen to but the fact is though is that I know that a lot of people listen to these guys and they have agreed to be on our show yeah they uh they um they recently gained more more exposure than ever because within the past month they've uh Screen Invasion took them on they're now produced by ScreenInvasion.com um Damn. yeah 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 um, I, and I just, uh, got lucky falling in with these guys. Like, um, my friends on the internet that I met over the course of the last year have really like, uh, or I guess two years now have really led to some great places. Um, if, if anybody out there is listening, wants to get a taste of gobbly geek, um, usually they're, uh, they're week by week, pretty, uh, uh, set on, um, what topics they're talking about, like what comics they read that week, what movies they saw that week, what TV shows were on, um, if they have a guest, what that guest is promoting. But if you want to get a taste of the guys and who they are, um, on my other podcast, So Let's Get to the Point, is probably the episode I'm most proud of, of out of the almost 40 I've done. Uh, uh, the episode's called um, A Gobble D to geek hard <laughs> and uh, uh you can find that at uh all one word so let's get to the point dot libsyn l-i-b-s-y-n dot com it's one of the first few ones that'll show up and uh uh the it's basically a profile on on who those guys are for two hours so i highly recommend that um in conclusion, before we wrap up, I just want to say how awesome it was to read those scenes, man. It was, it was. Oh yeah, thanks. Oh yeah, thanks. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty proud of them, and I've got, I'm, I, when I get home from work tomorrow, I think I'm going to do twenty and twenty-one, and then that only leaves me twenty-five, twenty-six, and twenty-seven, and I'll be done with my half of the movie. Just fucking work, Ken. <laughs> Thanksgiving, man. Th Thanksgiving, I'll be stuck in Portland, and nothing will be open. So. <laughs> that's that, that's my goal for Thanksgiving. Sh Sean, had you read these scenes before you came today? No, I hadn't heard them at all. Yeah, these these scenes are literally. I got done with sixteen an hour before we started recording. Awesome, <laughs> awesome. Um, well, um, I guess. If you guys want to, I mean, I'm sure you'll have family stuff around Thanksgiving, but uh, within the next two nights after Thanksgiving, if you guys can get together, um, uh, I'll be out of town. Okay. I'll be out of town until Sunday night, so I probably won't be able to until sometime next week, and Sean's going to be work on my fucking crazy dick. All right. Well, yeah. Like, as always, just let me know when uh, you guys can. And uh, I will I will have my half written by the time we talk again. All right, cool. Sounds good. All right. Yeah, uh, doing, guys. yeah I love you guys. Miss you guys. Love you too. <laughs> oh yeah, Batman. Oh yeah, yeah, Batman quote. Uh, uh, I don't have the uh, a working internet, so if you guys can look one up or think of one on the spot, I'm sure you can. These aren't the droids you're looking for. No, wait, hold on. <laughs> hey, guys, I, I met uh, Dan Harmon. 
Well, we heard. How'd you hear? Christian. Oh. Uh, Christian's yeah. like, oh my God, Dan Harmon called me. What the fuck? <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, uh, Batman line. Batman quotes internet. What is, is hold on, this one. Oh wait, we've already done that one. You're not the devil. You're practice. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, how's it going? All right, later, guys. Uh, see you.